Welcome to Taoist Secrets, The Great Awakening, a podcast by practicing disciples of Taoism at the Temple of Original Simplicity. This is Episode 4. Today, Master Richard Prococo, David Wright, and Peter Lafarge discuss the concept of the metaphysical castle and how cultivating perseverance will not only help you in this life, but help prepare you for the test of the bardo in the afterlife. As we spoke about in the previous podcasts, there is a link between our physical health and our mental health and well-being. Grandmaster Anatole calls it the psychosomatic aspect of disease, in that if the mental channel is blocked, it can affect the physical body and its physical operation and immune system. And if the physical body is blocked, conversely, it can affect the mental channel and its operations. It can bring confusion and a host of mental illnesses. There is a particular meditation that has interactions with the great spirits where you visualize going to a castle in another dimension. Grandmaster Anatole explained to us the symbolism of the castle in the meditation. And the castle represents a place where you feel comfortable to go in the meditation. The idea is that you build this kind of metaphysical sanctuary uh, for yourself to be able to interact with the spirits that you've met there and as a place of safety for you that you can go and still communicate and be in the other dimension. The interesting thing is that the castle represents your psychic energy, which is a manifestation of your mental state. If you go to your castle and it's In disrepair, if it's falling down, that represents your mental state. It represents a breakdown or weakness in your mental state. So by maintaining your castle and working on it and keeping it clean and orderly and up to date, that also has an effect on your mental state. The castle can also be under attack. Uh, Many times when you go to the castle, there's invading armies or spies or someone trying to get into your castle. And that represents an attack or aggression in your regular life. The idea is that your psychic energy is uncomfortable or agitated in some way. And when your castle's under attack, you should look into your life and see if there's some kind of conflict going on with your mental state or conflict with your psychic energy. So the castle represents your mental state and psychic energy. And as we know, the state of your mental health affects your physical health. So these meditations are very interesting to kind of glean some state of how your mental well-being is. And we go to the castle on a periodic basis, weekly or bi-weekly, to check our mental state and to work on our mental health. Also, it's it's not just a state of our mental health. It's a way for us to repair our mental health. So when we go to our castle, if our castle is under attack or it has been attacked and there's damage to it, or if it's not even in such a dramatic sense, if it's just dirty and needs to be cleaned, by cleaning it, by repairing it, by fortifying it with more men, more soldiers, then you are repairing your mental health. I came to this meditation a little later than you two did. You guys were already well into it by the time I came along. I think it gave me a slightly different perspective that I kind of had to hit the ground running, as it were, to understand it where you had already been there. But I found at first that the the thing that surprised me the most, I think, about the castle is that it's not a static thing. Not just in the sense that it can be damaged and you may get there and discover, oh, the front wall is cracked and you have to repair it, or the skylights are broken, or some physical aspect of it is damaged and you need to repair it, or that it's dirty, which I often found I had to clean up. Uh, Nothing serious, but just sweeping the floors, that kind of thing. But it changes over time and that you explore it over time. When I first got there, it was a fairly restricted space. There was one main corridor and there was a room off that corridor that I used to go into. And there was a stairway down one side, which I had partly explored. But after I'd been doing this meditation for a while, I discovered that there was more of it now. That there was a, the corridor that I had been in went off in the other direction as well. It went down to a big room that had a couple of comfortable chairs in it and a fireplace, and there was a 
even a little apartment there. And I've since discovered there, there are yet other rooms off of that room. I never know exactly what I'll be doing when I get there because I usually take direction from my fox spirit who says, okay, we're going to go here, you need to do this today, or maybe we're not going to go there at all, maybe we're going to go someplace else. But all of these things changed and became more definite, more filled out, more detailed over time. Master Pococo, you had an experience at a castle that introduced you to your, your spirit animal. Would you mind uh, recounting that? In Chinese mythology, I was born under the sign of the tiger. And a lot of my meditations, there is the symbolism of the tiger as part of my uh, lineage at birth, I guess. In one of the first meditations to the castle, Grandmaster Anatole gave us a handful of rice. And he, he didn't give it to us, but he said symbolically in the meditation, when you go to the, fly to the other dimension and go to your castle, and your castle can be in any form. It can be modern, it can be medieval, it can be uh, chalet, it can be however it visualizes in your meditation. My particular castle is more or less medieval, and it borders a great ocean on one side, which makes it tactically very easy to fortify. As part of the meditation, Grandmaster Anatole said, when you first go to the castle, to reach into your pocket and pull out a handful of rice and to throw that rice on the ground, and from the grains of rice, your army of soldiers would appear. So the magic rice would actually grow your army of soldiers, and the, the army of soldiers would be the soldiers who would uh, listen to you, who would follow you, and protect your castle from harm. You could use them to repair, to clean, to fight enemies, and you can deploy them in any way. And that's one of your tactical resources at the castle. When I pulled the rice from my jacket and I threw them on the ground, instead of soldiers appearing, I got a bunch of tigers. And oddly enough, I could communicate telepathically with these tigers and at least give them rudimentary instructions. So the soldiers in my castle are tigers. In the plains in front of the castle, there's a huge... 50-foot statue of a tiger in like a sitting position. And that's part of the configuration of my castle. On the back side, it has a large wall uh, with an ocean. And on the front part, there's some planes there. And there's a 50-foot statue of a tiger sitting in front of the castle. So is this a tiger that's in tiger form? Or is it more like a tiger with a human body and a tiger head? It's a tiger in tiger form sitting on all fours, like in a dog position. And so are the soldiers when I threw the rice. They were physical tigers. They weren't spirits where they had the head of a tiger and the body of a human, but they were actual physical tigers. So they weren't were tigers, like a werewolf. They were, were, they were tigers. Correct, tigers. Although I could communicate with them and give them rudimentary instructions telepathically. Even that's very interesting. Most communication and meditation is nonverbal. It's, it's telepathic communication between you and the spirit world or you in the interaction with the beings that you have there. So your ability to focus, to frame your thoughts and to ask questions internally is, that, is very, very important. The method of communication is almost solely telepathic. And you have to be very clear in what you're thinking. I remember in one of my earlier meditations, there was a female spirit with whom I was interacting and she was very beautiful. And I had a few thoughts that drifted across my mind and she, she relayed to me that she could read my mind. I apologize profusely, of course, but you do need to be very cautious. You need to really restrain your thoughts and, you know, even your cowardness, your, your confusion, your, all your horrible flaws, you need to be very focused in the way you communicate with these spirits. One other thing that uh, I, you've reminded me of is when I was first getting familiar with the castle, do the throw the handful of rice and get the soldiers. Now my soldiers are just regular human soldiers. One thing I do is when I go to my castle, that's not the first place I go at the beginning of the meditation. I usually go there after a few minutes. My approach to the 
castle varies depending on my mood and what I think might be necessary, that there have been times when I may just appear there. I might just uh, show up, but sometimes I will approach from the ground outside to check the alertness of the soldiers and to see how, how do they react. And I may, one of the uh, things about meditation is that you do have considerable flexibility in how you present yourself and how you, what sort of form you take on. Sometimes I might be a giant approaching the castle towards its, its uh, mine is configured differently from the ones you've been describing, that it's in, it's a more medieval looking castle and it is inside a moat, although the moat is not filled with water, it's merely a depression mm -hmm. in the ground, and there's only a causeway to get there. So if I approach, and I'm very large, and seeing the soldiers deploy themselves behind good cover to be able to protect themselves but still be able to attack when the opportunity arises just to see how are they doing. There's only one commanding officer there, and I will usually just speak to him, and I'll just ask him, how are things going? How are the men doing? What do you need? Does he have a name? I don't know that he has one. I usually just refer to him as the major. Master Pococo, do you have any tigers that have an individual personality that you communicate with? Uh, yes. After several castle meditations that we had, at one point in the meditation, I had used the mirror to fly to another dimension. As I was in this other dimension, I came across a tar pit, almost like the La Brea tar pits. In the tar pit was this very old and large saber-toothed tiger. I could see that the tiger was in grave danger of, of you know, being pulled under in this tar pit. So I'm not sure why. Sometimes in meditation, just as in regular life, situations and opportunities present themselves to you and you need to make snap decisions on what you do. And sometimes those things are, you know, it's just how you react, just like how you would react in the physical world. So I snapped a branch off this tree and I, and I put it in the top pit to the tiger, and he grabbed onto it with his mouth, and after quite a bit of physical struggle, I was able to pull him from the top pit. And I brought him to my castle, and he was nursed back to health. And now he's like my confidant in the castle. King Tarid, his name is. He told me that he was of the race of celestial tigers, and his name was King Tarid. He's much larger than the other tigers in the castle, as he's a prehistoric saber-toothed tiger, but he's very old. So his, um, his muscularity, he's kind of thin, and you can see like his bones through his coat. And yet when I go to the castle, every time I go there, I meet my fox spirit and I meet my tiger, King Tarid. And he's the one who usually tells me the state of the castle telepathically. He'll tell me if there's an invading army. He'll tell me if there's some issue with the other tigers. For instance, there was a birth at one point that we went and witnessed. He'll tell me if there's some kind of problem with the castle that needs to be fixed. So really, he's like my major, King Tarid, the prehistoric saber-toothed tiger that I pulled from the top hit. I found that one of the things that, that I think surprised me about the castle is that although it's a psychic place that has all these representations to it, it has this mundane aspect too, that one of the things that I always do when I go there is I restock all of the food supplies that the soldiers need during the week. That if I'm gone, say if I miss a meditation, so I'm there for less often, that the supplies are more depleted and sometimes they can be pretty low. So I have to restock the beverages, the meat, the produce, and so on. It's something I can do fairly quickly, but it is something I have to do regularly because the supplies are always depleting because the soldiers are eating them. I have a um, marshal, Marshal Cedric. He's in charge of my armies, and he's the one who gives me, just like your, your saber-toothed tiger, the king, he gives me the update when I first arrive there, tells me what needs to be focused on, and also he'll, he'll give me some um, what he perceives of my state of mind when I get there. If, if I'm in a crappy mood, he'll say, so something's troubling you. And he almost acts like, almost like a therapist or a psychiatrist or, or even just a mentor, someone I can talk to, who gives me, this is the, what I find interesting is, he'll give me perspectives that I wasn't even considering myself. If I'm 
having a situation at work or in personal relationships, I'll express to him my perspective and he'll say, well, perhaps maybe you should look at it this way, which I, I find still amazing to this day after 30 plus years of doing this meditation that I'm able to gain counsel from a spirit in my spirit castle. There's another interesting aspect to the castle that Grandmaster Anatole shared with us in that every castle has a snake altar there, an altar to the snake god or the snake goddess. The snake in Chinese represents wisdom. Since the snake can crawl through holes in the earth, it has perspective on the earth like no other creature. The snake, it's not a, a method of temptation like in other religions, but it represents wisdom. Each castle has an altar to the snake goddess, and you can go there to do what's called the fears and worries meditation. And this is also a hook to the purging and cleansing of your mental state. That's why it's part of the castle meditation. When you go to the castle, you can go to the snake altar and you visualize your fears and worries as almost, it's kind of a vulgar analogy, but it almost looks like defecation in that the fears and worries come out of your navel as manifested as this blackness that you push out of your navel. And then the snake statue on the altar comes alive and eats this this dirt that comes out of your navel and gets rid of it. And that's the idea of the fears and worries meditation, that you visualize your fears and worries as physical dirt, and you push them from your body through your navel. And then the, the spirit of the snake comes alive, and it can burn this dirt and eat it. And that's a very interesting aspect, too. I always do the fears and worries meditation. It helps me to ease my fears and worries in life. And that's a very important aspect for us to operate normally and to see things clearly. Our fears and worries can create confusion with us. They can blow things out of proportion and not allow you to see things clearly. I found that when I go to do the fears and worries meditation, which as you say is a more regular thing and something we really do need to do, the snake spirit there often he comes alive before that point and he he tells me how many of these balls of dirt I should try to expel onto the altar. When I reach that number, then he has me stop, and he will then eat them or burn them. He can breathe flame more like a dragon, really, just to burn the stuff up. It's fascinating to watch because the altar appears to be made of wood, and yet it's never damaged by the flame. It's one of those little side things. Um, but it's interesting because I always ask, is there anything I can do for you? in return for this, and almost always says no. Very rare. And that is that is one of the phrases that we use when we meet a spirit, is thank you for seeing us. We, we express gratitude. How may we serve you? How may I serve you? And usually the spirit will give you some instructions, or they'll go tell you to do something, or maybe not even respond. I remember for the longest time when we first started meditating and seeing spirits, I had no interaction, or I, I had interaction, but no communication from the spirits. I would ask them questions, or ask them if what can I do for you? What should I be doing? And they were silent. So it, I think for me, it took a good six months, three months before I had any communication from a spirit. Yeah, the these are ongoing relationships. I think that, I don't know if we've brought that particular point of it out before, but that I think one of the things that people don't recognize is that this requires persistence, that the spirits won't necessarily speak to you initially in fact, you may not even see them initially. I didn't see any for the first couple of months that I was meditating and doing the burning meditation. And then even when I did, I didn't know who they were. I mean, I knew there was a spirit there, but the room in which it was was dark, so I didn't know who was in there. And I finally asked, could you turn a light on so I could see who it is I'm talking to? And, then, and this has been an ongoing thing that as you're sphere expands, I guess, as your realm of experience expands, you encounter more spirits, and you're not going to encounter them unless they want to talk to you. You can ask, but they aren't going to speak to you unless they feel like it, not just because you want to. You have to earn the right for them to communicate to you. Not, earn the, not even a right, earn the privilege. Privilege, and I think this is one thing that, we, we talked about this in one of our earlier meditations, that just going to a spirit, say I'm having a string of bad luck, 
So I want to go to the god of good luck and say, can you turn this around for me? Well, that's like being one of those people who your friends will only show up when they uh, need something from you and you never hear from them the rest of the time. We talked about that, I think, in the first podcast. It's the same thing here, that if you have an ongoing relationship with these spirits, then maybe you can ask, say, I'm having trouble in this area. Can you help me? You don't want to be too specific, but can you help me? To just show up at an altar, plunk down some incense and say, please help me with this. No. A lot of times our initial interactions with the spirits, because of our lack of focus and our imperfect nature and our limitations with telepathic communication and focus, it's very hard to communicate with the spirits. In a way, as we are a lower life form, our ability to communicate and focus in the meditation is so much lower than the great spirits that many times it's just hard for them to communicate with us because we don't understand. Many times when I get a message from the great spirit or the spirits that I'm interacting with, they'll repeat the same message over and over again. So one, I'll remember this message, and two, I'll understand the essence of this. I think the fact that when you go initially into the meditation and it starts to open for you and you start to see spirits in the meditation, they don't initially communicate with you just because our ability to communicate, we're like a neophyte with this. We're, we're not good with this and it's hard for and it's frustrating for them to try and communicate with us. It's like communicating with a dog. For us to understand what they want from us and what the symbolism is in the meditation and to get the message clearly that they're trying to impart to us has to do with your focus and your ability to communicate telepathically, which goes with your visualization and your training, your training of your third eye and your psychic energy. As your psychic energy gets larger and stronger, your ability to communicate with the great spirits also increases. It's very common for people to get a message of some sort during a meditation. You hear the words, but you really have no idea what it's about. The usual procedure here is write it down and see if over the next week or so it becomes clear to you, which it may. You may encounter some new circumstance. You suddenly say, ah, that's what it's about. Or you may just have a moment of insight and say, okay, now I, I think I see what they were talking about. But you may not get it right at the time. That's pretty common. Grandmaster Anatole will say that often after meditation. He'll express what happened, uh, convey what happened, and he'll say, well, think about it. Or he'll say, it'll come to you in a week or so, what, what the, the message was that they were trying to impart upon you. And a lot of time, just conversing with the Grandmaster will help to understand what the meditation is about in the symbolism. Many times he'll interpret the meditation for us and say, be careful, watch out for this, something's going on with your health, you're fighting some kind of virus, something may manifest in your life where it is some kind of attack. Not a physical attack, but some kind of conflict that you'll have with interactions with other people. The master and his knowledge of the symbolism and his estimation of the meditation is also a, a large tool for us to understand what we should do with the knowledge that we accumulate um, you know, as part of the meditative interactions. He does it too to make sure that nothing strange is going on in there too because unlike with Tai Chi or, or martial arts where you can see what a person is doing and you can correct it right then what he's observing. With meditation, there's no monitor into our brains as to what we're experiencing, what we're doing. All he does have is for us to recount to him clearly what, what we experienced so that he can have some degree of what it is we're doing in there. He's warned about if you encounter a spirit that says things that are perhaps, if they say, don't tell your master, or if, <laughs> if they're conveying other ideas to you that don't make sense, it's important that we communicate those to him because as we've said before, the metaphysical realm is not a it's not a arcade, it's not a playground. It can be a very dangerous place, and if you don't have the right instructor giving the right guidance, the right direction, and you're also not aware like you are in this world, then you could possibly find harm. Right. One of the things that you mentioned earlier is that your castle it may represent your psychic energy and you'd want it to be a secure place where you can go. But 
as people have often found in these meditations, the castle may be under attack when you get there. And in fact, many people have said when they get inside the castle, they discover there are invaders inside the castle. So clearly there are hazards. And if you find invaders inside your castle, of course you want to get rid of them. And that's usually people's first order of business when they do. It's an unsettling thing to find. The Grandmaster explained to us before that that the existence of parallel dimensions has been known by Taoist masters for centuries. And when they go into meditation, they traverse these parallel multiple dimensions to glean advice from the spirits. Just as we have in our dimension, the existence of the food chain, the idea of predator and prey, this food chain analogy also exists across dimension. It's a multi-dimensional phenomenon. And a lot of times we'll see that phenomenons that manifest in nature, in our physical earthly plane, are also principles that exist in the meditative realms and in the infinite parallel dimensions that we traverse. Many times we have what are called spiritual predators. And these spiritual predators or malevolent spirits, as we've called them in previous podcasts, can come to this dimension to feed off of other living beings' chi energy. The chi, our vital force, our soul, that what keeps us alive in our waking state is the food that binds these other spiritual predators to this dimension. So we need to be very careful. When we meditate, we have to be under the protection of the temple and of the master. Clearness of mind and strong, healthy chi that you accumulate through philosophical understanding and through yoga and meditation and physical Taoist practices helps to build your chi and protect you against these spiritual predators. Clearness of mind and strength of chi is the only thing that will save you from these spiritual predators. If you're confused and weak, you're, you're basically sustenance and prey for these spiritual predators. We need to be very, very careful as there's a multitude of entities that come to this dimension to feed off of humans' physical chi. And the ancient Chinese have believed for thousands of years that when a person is sick, that it's not just some physical ailment, that it is an attack by these malevolent forces. And that's why they would use meditation, herbs, exorcism to purge these malevolent forces. They would use these various methods to expel these, these forces. And if you noticed, we didn't use the word destroy or kill. We don't destroy or kill these malevolent forces because they're metaphysical forces that at least from my understanding, we are unable to destroy. We can only repel them. That's why the term exorcism, we drive them out. We drive them out from the vessel that they're in. It's important to not be confused. It's important to have a healthy body because if you are in a good, fit, strong body, a malevolent force will pass on you because you're a hard target. They want easy prey, just like a, a real predator in, in this world. A lion hunts old and sick and young and tired prey, basically. They don't go after strong prey who's going to give them a hard time. Coming back to what David said earlier about the, the castle not being a static entity, uh, my castle has changed from the first time I, I, we began going there to what it is now. And like the two of you, it is a medie medieval castle. And as the years have progressed, I realized what the terrain looked like around the castle. Uh, before I was just focused on what was inside the castle, I have an ocean on one side of my castle, as you do. And then on another side, I have a field that leads to a forest. Another side, I have a river that runs behind it. And then on another side, I have a, like a sand dune that leads to a desert. And this has gone from being a huge castle, and it's, it's slowly reduced its size, like to maybe half the size of what it used to be. And through the years, I've also discovered this doorway that would lead in a spiral down into this dark area that I couldn't see beyond the spiral. And eventually, after what seemed like hours, I would get to the bottom of the spiral and it would lead to this basement. And it turns out that it was a, a throne room for the, the god of primordial chi. 
and that's where I began to encounter him. After some interaction, he exposed me to this well that was right next to his, his throne, and by going through this well and diving to the bottom of it, I would open up a door that was there, and it would bring me back out to my castle. So it had this, this bizarre, almost like M.C. Escher type of transportation. I remember, uh, I think I mentioned this in an earlier podcast, that when you talk about the changes in the castle, it can both be something large like finding additional rooms or corridors, uh, going to new places, or it can be more subtle that, for me, the main corridor at one point was just large flagstones. And each week when I went there, I would see it was a little bit dirty, so I'd, have, I'd sweep it and get the dirt removed. And then a few months ago, I got there one day, and it had completely changed. And it was the corridor was still there. It was still the same place. But now it was covered with white crushed stone, and instead of, and which I think was over the flagstones, and there was water flowing through these stones. It was not very deep water, maybe a half inch deep. And I'm not, I wasn't sure where it was coming from, why it was there. I'm still not sure why it's there, but it's still there. And in fact, I ran into difficulties that the water level seemed to be rising, and I was pretty sure that was bad. So I finally asked my fox spirit, how do I stop this water from rising? And he showed me a place where the water was coming from. It was actually a big pipe and with a valve on it, and then I could close this valve to keep the water level from being so high. Whatever the meaning of this is, I haven't figured that out yet. I was going to say, what do you think that represented, this, this water valve that was overflowing in your castle? No, I haven't given it a lot of thought. I figure when he wants me to know, he'll probably tell me. But it was quite a surprising change and quite dramatic. And in fact, usually when I was going to the altar, I would go there from that corridor. There's a couple of very large doors. They're so tall that I can barely reach the handles to pull them open to walk through. And then I would walk through this very large dark room to reach the altar room. And initially the large dark room was also full of junk. It was dark enough that I couldn't really see what it was, but it was enough to make it rather difficult to walk through. So I had to walk slowly and carefully so I didn't trip. And about the time the change occurred in the corridor, the room pretty much emptied. It's, it's still about as big as it was, but there's nothing in there now. The, the way is clear to walk towards the altar room. But even there, when I get to the entrance to the altar room, I'm supposed to burn some incense before I go into it. There are various small altars in front of it, but they're always different. Every week, sometimes there's two of them, sometimes there's only one, and they are always different. I never really know what I'm going to encounter when I get there. It's very interesting that the Grand Master, the sacred teachings state that, that the physical body, the human being, is a microcosm of the great universe. And the earth is also a microcosm of the great universe. And each one of those things are microcosms of each other. What that means is, just like the cellular structure, is a microcosm of the whole body. It means that the full genetic type of the person is encompassed in every single little tiny cell. What that means is if the human being is a microcosm of the great celestial cosmos, it means that the human being, the earth, and the celestial cosmos are all made up of parallel dimensions with a multitude hundreds and thousands of spirits that go through all of those things. So the human body itself is made up of internal parallel dimensions with a multitude of spirits that navigate those things. The earth itself is made up of a multitude of parallel dimensions with residing spirits, and so is the celestial cosmos. The idea is by analyzing the dimensions within yourself through meditation, like your castle, right, which represents your psychic energy. Those experiences help you to understand the earth, the relationship of the earth to you. And those experiences help you to understand and relate to the celestial cosmos. 
So these three things are actually microcosmic components of each other, just as a living cell is a full component of the living body. And I thought that this was very, very interesting, that many times we navigate dimensions that are within our own body. And getting to know ourselves through navigating these dimensions, that's how your castle opens up to you. So each time you go, it's different. Or you may see another floor, or you may see other rooms that you haven't, you know, you haven't um, experienced before. So those things open as you progress, as you get to know those things better. It helps you to understand the relationship of the earth and the celestial cosmos. By understanding a little piece of the model yourself, it helps you to understand these other components and the relationship between them, which as we spoke about, the relationship between the human, the earth, and the celestial cosmos is one of chi and the sharing of chi energy across those three entities. Well, that's been one of the, the underlying themes of Taoism in general is that because we are so small and so limited, we really can't understand very much. And the only avenue we have to understanding the universe is by analogy that um, the Tao itself is unknowable and all we can see is the manifestation that appear in the world, the uh, interactions and how things come and go and grow and decay. Working through analogy is one of our most powerful principles. There was one meditative experience at my psychic energy castle that was very salient for me. When I got there, my saber-toothed tiger spirit explained to me that the plains in front of my castle were full of this invading army. And they had got it within the perimeters of the walls of the castle. And it was a very tenuous and dangerous circumstance as they were at the gates, at the doors of my castle, this invading army. There is a way to go in from the bottom from the castle where it meets the ocean and there's like a hidden entrance way to get in that way. And the tigers are all on the lower level. We went in through the hidden entrance into the castle. We deployed some of the tigers into the plains to fight with these spirits. And then, oddly enough, I went up into the upper reaches of the castle. And I in, instinctively, without really thoughts, this, this is what was kind of interesting to me, in that I knew what to do, and I wasn't quite sure what I was doing. So I went to this room that was behind um, the throne chair in the great room where most of my interactions are in the castle. And as I pulled aside this curtain, there was a huge metal lever. And when I pulled this metal lever, the 50-foot tiger statue that's in front of my castle, the mouth opened, and it pulled all this ocean water from the backside of where the ocean was and flooded these plains with millions of gallons of water. So it basically washed away this invading force by utilizing the, the design of the castle itself. So the design of the castle itself was fortified to flood these plains with these ocean waters through this gigantic tiger statue that's been there. So that was a very interesting meditation for me as, as I was the one who pulled the lever, but yet I could almost see myself doing it. Like I didn't understand exactly what I was doing, but yet I had the knowledge to do this, to flood the plains and to rid my castle and save it from this invading army. And by contrast, sometimes the things happen in your castle that are not only surprising, but that you had no previous knowledge of. That as I think I mentioned, my castle has gotten bigger, or at least I'm aware of more of it now. I've gone to places that I wasn't aware of before. When I went to the more recent editions, at one point my fox spirit guide told me, go into this side room over here, which I had never been inside. So I went in, and inside it there were three pedestals, which were empty. While I stood there trying to decide, all right, what is the significance of this, I actually had the god of war appear on one of these. This was now going to be his pedestal. He wasn't necessarily going to be there all the time, but if I went into that room, if he wanted to speak to me, that that was where I was going to go, and that that's where I'd see him, 
I have since been back there on multiple occasions and have seen him there, and he has often given me some sort of advice or information. It's not a weekly thing. It probably doesn't happen more than once every four to six weeks, but it does happen, and I've gotten some very useful advice and guidance there. And the other two pedestals in that room have almost never been occupied. In fact, I think each one of them has only been occupied once. Once was the god of literature, and then once was the god um, Senku, who is responsible for uh, destroying a lot of the malevolent spirits in this world. I at first, and in fact I still don't really understand why those other two were there, because since I've only seen them once and they didn't really speak to me, I'm not sure what the significance of this is, but it's it's there, and I just have to have uh, confidence that sooner or later I'll figure it out and that there'll be a particular circumstance when I will see them and I will speak to them and they'll have something to tell me or something, some reason for me to be there. I find it interesting that through the many years of meditating, there are certain spirits that have been a great part of, of my interactions, God of War, the God of Longevity. When we first began meditating, I would see on a regular occasion, and then it stopped and other spirits would come in and I would interact with them, and then they would go away. And now I have a handful of spirits that I see now on a regular basis. But it seems that certain spirits come and go, perhaps it has something to do with our lives and where we are in our development, our, our cultivation. Not that I don't ever see these spirits again, but they were such a regular part of my my travels and my, my experiences. I always thought it was interesting that there would be this entire array of these these spirits that I would see, as opposed to some people who may, mainly just see one, two, or three different spirits, and, and that's pretty consistent throughout their entire meditative experience. There is a huge pantheon of Chinese gods and also there's many other types of entities that exist, spiritual entities or spiritual predators. We do categorize some of these in the Holy Fox book, these spiritual predators. We lean on the pantheon of the Chinese gods to help us and support us. Many times the Grand Master has also told us that all of life is a preparation for death. So philosophical purification and the building of your chi, the understanding of your place in the great universe and where you fit, all of that is part of your education and development of when you die and what happens after. The Grand Master has said that when, at the moment of your demise, that your soul will divide in two parts, two major parts. In one part, the Po soul goes down into the earth to be judged in the yellow source. In the other part of your soul, the Hun, goes up and, and allows us, when those two entities are judged and purified, they come together. And if the judgment is good, we'll continue on to the Bardo, which is the corridor between life and death, and will help us to decide what happens in our next rotation of existence as an entity. Many times, the Bardo is an incredibly scary place where we're tempted with fears and worries. And really, the temptation is for us to choose to come back to this earthly plane over and over again and still go through the suffering of our existence that we've had for several rotations. And this isn't a desirable thing. What we're supposed to do is to jump into the fire there for purification and development to the next realm of our intellectual and spiritual existence. Many times the relationships that you forge with the great pantheon of Chinese spirits, you can call on them and they can help you in the bardo to navigate these false dimensions that are uh, like temptation for us to jump into. Enticing you to jump through these escape portals. That's exactly. So the interactions that we have with the great spirits in our castle help us to forge these relationships where they'll help us it, when, we, when we die and when we transition to the next rotation. 
Sometimes these spirits can be ancestors of ours that we've prayed to or interacted with in meditation. Many times they're classic Chinese gods from the Taoist pantheon, like the god of war, for instance. Or Dave mentioned Zen Ku, who's one of the main exorcism gods uh, that helps to expel malevolent influences from the place that you live and from your physical body. The relationships that we forge and develop with the great spirits help us in this time of transition when we die. They'll help us and support us, which is an incredibly important aspect to this idea of praying and acquaintance with the other dimension. One of the things that Graham Asks told us about Zenku, for example, is that he can, if you are, after you die, if your spirit is confused and is having trouble navigating and getting through the bardo, that he can help you to push you through. I actually mentioned this, this, this information came to me one night during my meditation, and I mentioned it to the Grand Master afterwards when we were wrapping up, and he said, yes, that's true, but I never told you that. The, the information we come away with can be very surprising. I would imagine that going through the bardo and facing whatever difficulties are, the horrors of the bardo, which is the, the little translation of it, the horrors of the bardo, and there's all these temptations to escape on all sides so that you don't have to go through this horror, that the spirits that do help you, I would imagine that they're not grabbing your hand and, and making it easier for you. They're probably like a great master, screaming at you to move your butt, keep moving, don't stop, don't be a quitter. That's just my, my theory, but then I don't think that they're going to take away the difficulty of this, this test of going through the bardo, but they will support you, but it may not necessarily be the support that you would anticipate, especially in this day of safe spaces and, and people being easily offended. It's probably still going to be a difficult test. Well, I think so, and one of the things that we've emphasized through all of this is that even meditation, which sounds like this very quiet, peaceful thing, is work. Yeah. It's not painful, ugly, horrible work, but it's effort. And that's a pale thing compared to what you're talking about going through in the bardo, but the point is that you're exerting effort no matter what, that something you get without effort is probably not worth having anyway. It's also interesting, the whole idea of the castle. I know the Grand Master has told us that development of the castle is some kind of safe haven for you in these other dimensions. Mm -hmm. And even when you, at the moment of your demise and you die, this castle can be a place where you reside after your death as some kind of spirit in the other dimensions. And this is a place for you to interact with your fox spirit and to glean enlightenment and advice and learning and teachings of the sacred principles with the Taoist spirits. So the development of your castle can exist even after you die. And it can be a place that's like a safe haven for you, basically where you live. You're creating your own, in a sense, in a Western sense, your own heaven by cultivating this castle. At some point, you need to know every inch of your castle and be that familiar with it. And possibly so you can retain this at your moment of death and recreate this. And one of the most important things is that the castle is a place of safety. It's protected and, and you've expelled malevolent influences from there and invading armies. It's a safe place to go where you won't be attacked. That's the idea. Matter of fact, I think that's one of the aspects that of the part of it that I've only discovered more recently is that it is a safe space, that it, it looks much like an apartment, in fact, living room, bedroom, that it's a, a place that's pleasant and comfortable and safe, feeling safe to go even if it's surrounded by challenges and other difficulties. And one of the important aspects of the castle is that it is you. You have to take care of this. You have to fight for it. You have to defend it. It's not something that you want to run away from and leave. It's, it is you. So you have to defend it. You have to foster it. You have to care for it. And then that's part of your, your, the development of your psychic energy and your third eye. Yeah, abandoning your castle would be, it's not a good thing to do. We know of someone who, who did that in one of their experiences, and not a criticism towards them, but it's, uh, it's, it's something you need to take ownership of, literally.
And I think the master said it in the truth of Tao. It's interesting how the physical principles can be perverted to bring some kind of cowardice, bending over. It basically, you, you know, so I'm above this confrontation. It's not, it's just you're hiding your cowardice behind this idea of saying that, like, you know, I won't fight, I'm above fighting. No, you're just a coward. Turn the other cheek, yeah. You're hiding your cowardice. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, this guy who ran into the woods and hid when his castle was under attack, it's you, it's your responsibility to fight. You own this, you're the one. You know what I mean? I, you know, you yeah. can't just run away. No, it's like not defending your body if somebody's trying to punch you. That's what you. I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, we, you know, the master brought this interesting aspect of this idea of quitting, you know, this quitter idea. When I was a little kid, I was uh, playing hockey, and I was probably like 10 years old. And my father was, he wasn't a spiritual man per se, uh, but he, he, had a, he grew up in, on the streets and he had a lot of natural wisdom that came from his experiences by growing up on the streets. Street smarts. Yeah, street smarts, exactly. He said to me how, you know, you have to, you have to stick up for yourself. So I, I was playing hockey as a little kid. I was probably 10 years old. And we had lost every single game that season, every single game. And about halfway through the season, I said to him, I don't want to do this anymore. This like sucks. You know, we're not winning and it's not fun. I don't want to do it. And he said to me, you're not quitting. He said, I don't care what you do. He said, but you're not quitting. You committed to do this and you're going to finish it. He said, if you don't want to play next year, that's fine. But you committed to do this and I don't raise quitters. You're not a quitter. You're not going to give up. That's what he said. You're going to see it through. You're going to finish because you committed to do it in the beginning. The Grandmaster brought this analogy of physical confrontation the same. I mean, when someone punches you in the head or, you know, like, that's not fun. Like, you don't want it. So you can give up, you know, and say, oh, I don't want it. But that, that perseverance, the idea of fighting, not quitting, comes from the same idea of fighting for your life. Self-preservation is actually not quitting no matter what. You can't quit. This spirit, or the strong spirit, this not quitting, it goes with this idea of survival. And that's why it's so important. This quitting aspect, just as we were talking about the Bardo now, it, again, one more insight came to me as we were discussing it. That's I was like, one. this is one more reason to cultivate this not being a quitter is because when you're going through the bardo... This is your ultimate test. So many people do quit because they, they, go they get the recycled. Cool exactly. They, they see something that's much more appealing than the difficulty that's ahead of them at the end of the bardo, this, this white light, the, the flame. I can, I can understand a little bit better now, and, and I'll continue to work on it, but why this quitting aspect is so important in this material world, this life right now, because like a muscle, we're building it so that we do have a chance when we get to the bardo, just a chance. Self-preservation. Well, I think we've all established, just by the fact that we're still here after all these years, that we don't quit just because it got difficult. Not, at least not this, that whether it's the martial arts or the meditation, it's hard sometimes. Sometimes it's painful, but we didn't quit. And I think that's establishing the pattern that's what your, your dad was talking about, that it, maybe it's hard, maybe it's boring, maybe it's not fun, maybe it's stressful, but you, you stick with it. You committed to it, and you're gonna, you, you see it through. You gave your word, and you committed to it. That's what he said to me. So you can't quit. You've got to finish it. And if you don't want to do it next year, that's okay, but you're not quitting. We're not quitters. You're not quitting. That's what he said to me. Thank you for listening to our podcast, Taoist Secrets, The Great Awakening. If you wish to learn more about Grandmaster Alex Anatoly, classical Taoism, and the Temple of Original Simplicity, please visit Tao.org. That's T-A-O dot O-R-G. You can also visit our Facebook page at the Center of Traditional Taoist Studies. Please join us for our next episode when we discuss a significant essay that served as an inspiration for the name of this podcast. It's written by the great Taoist sage Chuang Tse and is titled, Those Who Dream of the Banquet wake to limitation and sorrow.